optional. Um, I think a lot of people here are going to go home tonight and start thinking about their job on this planet. Um, so now we're heading into our main panel tonight, and I'm excited to welcome to the stage some amazing experts. Um, first off, I'd like to welcome J.R. Hammond, Executive Director for the Canadian Air Advanced Mobility. Next up, we have Elizabeth Charmley, Executive Director for the Vancouver Maritime Centre for Climate and Senior Manager for West Coast Marine Initiatives for the Government of BC. Next off, we have Brian Martin, Director and Partner of TELUS Ventures. And last but not least, we have Bert Vandersage, CEO of Harbour Air. Please join me in welcoming our esteemed panel to the For our audience members, we are going to have a Q&A following our discussion, so if you do want to go to slido.com and use hashtag VEF, if you have any questions that pop up throughout our, our discussion, please do, um, and you can also vote on other people's questions. So we will come back to that after our discussion. So let's get started. Before we dive into this exciting discussion, if you could just go through and provide a quick intro and a little bit of background to the audience on your background and what you are innovating on in mobility. Excellent. Uh, so good evening, everyone, and thank you, Healy, and the entire VEF team for hosting us here this evening. My name is J.R. Hammond, and I'm pri privileged to serve as the executive director for our federal not-for-profit, Canadian Advancer Mobility, that is co-founded with the NASA equivalent in Canada, the National Research Council. We have a sole mission as a federal entity to expedite Canada's transition on route to zero emission aviation before 2050. This has brought us together in creating an ecosystem across the country in academia, capital, infrastructure, and of course our operators, which we'll hear from today as well, on showcasing how this new technology from electric, hydrogen, and small-scale nuclear aircraft can revolutionize how we move people, goods, and services across our country. We have our own microphones, which is really great, but thank you. I appreciate the on-stage um, com camaraderie. Uh, my name is Elizabeth Charmley, and I am executive director, co-founder, and board chair of the Vancouver Maritime Center for Climate. We are a not-for-profit, industry-led organization, and our mandate is to help the regional maritime and shipping transport uh, industry decarbonize. Um, so how sort of led me to this point in founding this organization is I'm an engineer is my background. I have a technical background. I'm a naval architect, and I had worked for 10 years for C-SPAN Ship Management, who is the world's largest container ship lesser. They have their head office here in Vancouver, and there I worked in the projects and technology department, which was supporting the projects component was the new build, and the technology was the support for the existing fleet. And when you look out in the harbor, you can see the terminals right here and the ships coming and going, and can container ships that size consume hundreds of tons of fuel every day. And so when I started there, they basically told me we need to reduce fuel consumption. And from a ship operator perspective, reducing fuel consumption was key, but really that was an environmental and emissions project to tackle. Um, so I worked deploying and developing different strategies and programs and technology implementation for them for 10 years. And as I was approaching the end of that period, and I didn't really know it was going to be the end of my 10-year career at that time, but I was approached by an economic developer here in Vancouver, and he asked me, what is the regional maritime industry doing when it comes to decarbonization? And I very honestly answered, I don't know, because I work on a global scale, but I'm a talkative naval architect, let's ask around. And so we did, and we had overwhelming support from industry here in our province that they wanted to form some sort of coalition or hub um, to get together and accelerate their progress towards zero. So that has been a really interesting journey, and I, we're, we're still working on that. I've spent about a year and a half working there full time. Um, and then recently I departed to work for the province of British Columbia in the Ministry of Jobs, Economic Development and Innovation because they are interested in setting up a branch of the government to support the economic development of the maritime industry here in our province. And I think a lot of people don't know, we kind of take for granted what we have right outside the windows here, that we are, the Port of Vancouver is Canada's largest port by magnitude. They handle 50% of Canada's ocean trade and Port of Prince Rupert is about 10 and Montreal and others trickle down from there. So that gives you an idea of the trade happening here. And likewise, the ocean economy is the largest here in BC by magnitude. So there is so much potential in this space in our province. And I'll stop there. Thank you. On to Brian. 
Hi, always a pleasure to be here at VEF and specifically with the Motivate conference. I don't think TELUS needs that much of a, an introduction, so I'll focus a little bit on TELUS Ventures. I'm a partner at TELUS Ventures. I spoke, focus predominantly on solutions within TELUS Business Solutions and also all of our CTOs offices. And over the past three years, I've grown the portfolio in, in really heavily investing in intelligent mobility where I think telcos have a real right to play and to win because you're seeing cellular connections being adopted in all generations of, of vehicles. You know, you've got vehicles that are retiring now from 3G, 4G, and they're moving now onto 5G, all vehicles that are coming off of manufacturing plants. So the folks that I've been really interested in is being, being working on the intersection of connected vehicles and traffic systems and also infrastructure so that it will be able to enable an autonomy revolution here within Canada and globally. So working with other large, very large strategic funds and strategic players and OEMs in hyper-precise geo-positioning down to five centimeter real time, um, intelligent traffic systems and also in the connected vehicle space. And the portfolio that I have under management is now worth over about 250 million. It's grown pretty sizably, um, both through investment and also write-ups over the last couple of years. And, I'm pretty proud that it accounts for about 40% of TELUS Ventures portfolio right now. So happy to be on this panel. Um, I really like working in the intelligent mobility sector. I think it's a good overlay in my background, which used to be geo-positioning, geospatial um, was where I first started my investment career. And then before that, it was in control systems technology. So happy to be here and share any insights I might have. And um, my name is Bert van der Steech. I'm the CEO of Harbor Air. If you did have a chance to uh, look out of the window of the beautiful facility here in Vancouver, you will have seen our uh, flights depart and arrive. Um, I had a very, very short commute coming here. Um, that's not because my office is right here in the harbor. I actually flew in from our Victoria office. That's where I've based myself. 30-minute um, flight time between Victoria and Vancouver, and that makes our type of flying perfectly suited for electric aviation. Um, we were the very first airline in the world back in 2019, late 2019, to operate an electric flight, and we're currently in the process um, of leading that transformation to a much more sustainable way of air transportation. Happy to be here. Thanks for inviting me. Wonderful, thank you so much for joining us. We have a really exciting panel tonight. Um, my first question actually starts with a bit of background. Um, we read a study our board was reviewing that was completed by the Vancouver Economic Commission that described Vancouver as a global leader in clean tech. In fact, we actually placed 16th in Startup Genome's top 35 clean tech ecosystems worldwide. With that in mind, I wanted to turn this first question off to Brian and then to JR. Um, to get your feedback on what initiatives are really exciting right now around any funding and innovation that can help us become a global leader in this space. Yeah, it's interesting because I don't, for me, that doesn't, that doesn't su su surprise me. You know, I think that when you look outside and the connection Vancouver has to nature, and it starts with the wonderful universities that we have within UBC and Simon Fraser University at our doorsteps that are doing a lot of science and education and engineering talent combined with nature that, you know, people would necessarily pursue a career path in clean tech and biotech. I know that, you know, in the early 2000s, mid 2000s, the gov government of BC had very specific initiatives with its fund of fund and VC mandates to invest specifically in biotech and gaming. And now more recently, with InBC, which is a new $500 million fund. It's very specifically targeted at impact investing. And we're seeing a lot more funds specifically when I started as a VC 10, 10 11 years ago, um, after I transitioned out of engineering. The, we're see, I wasn't familiar with the concept of impact funds. I know that we have renewal funds here, which has a legacy, and they were an earlier speaker today. But now you see an emergence of a lot more impact funds within BC. You've got the 500 million in BC, which is 
is now starting to do direct investments, but I also think of the Amend Fund based out of Victoria, which is fundraising right now. There's also another impact investor. So you're very seeing very specific now funding that's going into companies that have an ESG score, have an ESG mandate. So I think that's also helping build the, the ecosystem. But I think this is a very natural place for, for climate tech. Um, you know, we've got an urban center here which lends itself to not having to commute, which I think also adds to, adds to the culture. So I think there's a lot, of, uh, a lot of initiatives from all levels of government that are trying to drive that change and drive that clean tech change. Yeah, and so Healy, just to build upon what Brian was saying, the incredible work going on at NBC right now is finally catalyzing that entire clean tech ecosystem and providing a one-stop source for some of that funding moving forward. Uh, to build upon it for the aviation side, we have to give incredible kudos to the Harbor Air team for really championing and being one of the first nationally and internationally on taking this electric aviation pathway, which if you look through any of the funding mechanisms on decarbonization of transportation, aviation is typically not included within that funding branch. Hence, this movement and pathway now created by Harbor Air has unlocked the ability from not only our provincial governments, more and more sustainability funding coming from there, but most recently the $350 million announced at the Paris Air Show last week for sustainable aviation initiatives across Canada. This is a landmark movement for our country in not only unlocking existing initiatives, but continuing to fund some of the great work already going on here in British Columbia as well. Thank you for showcasing that. Um, I'm gonna jump around on our questions to build off of that. Um, just wanna highlight that in addition to what JR shared that the electrification that um, Harbor Air is doing has been so successful and I know that you've transformed a traditional aircraft to an electric plane and if the last time we spoke there was about 80 flights that you'd completed successfully. Curious if you could share with our audience tonight um, if it was difficult to implement this technology and also if um, it will be safe in the future to have passenger flights on longer journeys and what innovations will be required to lead in this space. Yeah, so safety first in our industry. Um, let's tackle that question <laughs> uh, first. Uh, obviously, we wouldn't operate anything that's not meeting our strict uh, safety uh, rules and regulations, our standard operating procedures. The current prototype e-plane that we're operating um, can do approximately 50 minutes of flight time. We operate within 30, 35 minutes. Um, again, that's the average of the typical flights that we operate. Um, uh, the remaining battery life is used for what we call in our industry alternate airports uh, in case of a diversion. Um, the second e-plane that we're currently building from scratch is um, going to be the one that we intend to certify and that one we hope to fly a little longer depending um, on our current test flying as well as the latest battery technology. Um, to, your, to your second uh, question there, how difficult is it to get an e-plane in the air? Uh, one of our project engineers actually here in the room, he might not, lead, he might not like my answer. Um, it actually isn't that difficult. Um, uh, we've operated 80 flights with very, very few surprises. Uh, the team, um, whether flight ops or engineering, um, is sometimes a little disappointed. Uh, when flights go perfectly well, exactly according to the book. Um, it turns out that the certification of an electric flight, an electric plane, um, as well as the funding, is a lot harder than actually getting an e-plane in the air. Appreciate you sharing that background. Um, to build on that question, I'm curious to know, outside of the obvious case for decarbonization, is there a business case right now for electric flight in Canada? Uh, there is none, uh, which is probably not unusual when we deal with uh, truly innovative ideas, and that's why uh, we've been calling uh, for um, active support, uh, tangible support, both from the federal as well as the provincial government. Um, we believe we've got a head start here in BC, right here in Vancouver, um, we've proven that we can actually do it, as I just said. Turns out it's not that difficult. Now it's time to, uh, to um, make this work. Um, we would like to be the very first airline in the world that can actually carry um, regular paying passengers flying commercially scheduled flights from A to B. 
but for that to happen, uh, we need to work together um, and, um, and make this a priority here. That's so exciting. I'm excited to be able to take an electric plane over to the islands. Um, I hope to see that in the future. And to build on the theme of decarbonization, I just want to turn this over to you, Elizabeth. Um, curious if you could share with our audience tonight how decarbonization is changing mobility in the maritime world. Yeah, for sure. I mean, that was something we had spoken about in our preparation call, too, and I think it's a really important topic. You know, uh, marine and shipping transportation is kind of like a dinosaur of an industry. Uh, when you think about ships, the technology has not really changed that much in the last hundred years. Ships are kind of like toilet paper. You know, it's just really basic. There's not much to innovate. And But, you know, in the last hundred years, what's happened... Sorry, I can hear a couple of chuckles. Well, it's true. Like, think about it, right? Like, what are you going to do here? It's basic, you know, principles of physics that cause ships to float and move through water. Like, how are we innovating this and making it any more efficient, right? Um, but we went from sail to steam, you know, to steam to the internal combustion engine, and that transition took 112 years more. We don't really have that kind of time now to start innovating in the shipping industry. We're looking at climate imperatives and legislation that are pressing upon us now. And likewise, it's not really about climate change, but it's climate changed. It's already changed. We can see that on a day-to-day -day basis when we look out the window. And ships have such a wide um, operating profile. You know, we have small coastal vessels, um, tugboats which operate differently, pilot boats, coastal ferries, and then we have deep sea transient vessels. So if you were here earlier, you heard me say the same thing, but when in the maritime sector, we're really looking at up what I would call a polyfuel future. And what I mean by that is, you know, ships have to adopt different types of technologies to get to zero. And I've kind of jumped a little bit ahead there because what I didn't give the background on is that ships can, you know, be optimized or decarbonization, reduce their emissions in many different ways. They can change their hydrodynamic appendages, but that can be maybe like a two, three, five percent reduction in emissions. They can do, you know, uh, vessel weather routing, route optimization, this sort of thing. But again, that's just a small amount uh, of fuel savings that they see. They can also do like upgrades to their main engine, main engine derating, exhaust fan, variable fans, things like this. But again, that's like less than 10%. The only real way they can get to zero is switching to an alternative fuel. And so the switch to alternative fuels is really, you know, driving the innovation in the industry the first time that we've seen in a very long time. Thank you for that background. Super helpful to learn. Um, to build on that, I want to turn this back to um, Bert and Brian, just to understand what your policy changes you think are needed to support innovation and mobility in Canada? Is it just funding, or what other initiatives can support adoption? Yeah, policy changes are a tough one when it comes to regulations and government, when it comes to mobility and climate change, because you know they're not being applied evenly, obviously, across the world, right? And we're in a global, global, global economy. You know, fundamentally, people like to move around. <laughs> you know, that's that really is the problem. We like to move around. We like goods to move around. So. You know, if I'm going to think of, of policy changes that are going to address climate change, you know, I don't know if it's going to be specifically for, for mobility, but it might be from investments in new types of materials, quantum computing, like if there is any hope for reversals of climate change, I'd say that it would be more of that type of leading edge technology. Quantum computers are really, really good at um, looking at new materials and new material discoveries. Um, and you can look at those to say, okay, well, if you're starting to look at, you know, new, new aircraft designs with very, very lightweight materials, or if you're looking at different conductive materials that are gonna be discovered, I'd say that quantum computers are probably gonna be the way to get to that. And I'd say that, you know, the, the funding that's being applied to quantum computers in the near term is gonna be towards material material discovery and Canada as a nation has a good policy initiative based out of Toronto for funding a quantum institute. We've got a quantum institute at Simon Fraser University and there's another quantum institute that's in Montreal. So I think that Canada is one of the leading nations in quantum and material discoveries that will then trickle down into mobility and into decarbonization. But I don't think it's going to be in the first or second horizon. We're talking about, you know, horizon three, which is going to be five to ten years, five to ten years from now. Thank you. We're sharing mics here. Um, the technicians probably thought there's this airline guy coming that will bring his own headset. Um, um, 
two key words for me. One, uh, funding. Um, the um, province of BC has been very, very supportive, and we're very grateful for the progress that we were able to make at Harbor Air um, with a um, $1.6 million grant that we've been given by the province of BC to get our e-plane project going. To date, we have not received a single dollar from the Canadian federal government, despite best intentions, despite pretty much every minister, every MP having visited us, having taken selfies in our e-plane, having been in the aircraft um, and saying the right things. Um, the second component um, is working um, with Transport Canada, in our case, on the regulatory approval process. We've got to move faster or else we're going to lose our head start. Thank you for sharing that background. I um, obviously don't work in government, but I am tempted to circulate maybe a petition after this to get this government funding for you guys. I'd love to see that in Canada. Um, to build on the topic of funding, um, some of you may have seen in the news that on June 19th, the Honorable Francois Philippe Champagne, Minister of Innovation, Science and Industry, just announced a new investment fund of $350 million to support Canada's new initiative for sustainable aviation technology. So this is mainly aimed to accelerate the green industrial transformation in aerospace. JR, this is your world. Curious to know what are some exciting innovations you're seeing in these segments and what do you think um, where do you think this will go, this funding round? Well, to Bert's point exactly there, we're finally seeing the federal dollars committed to these projects. So coming from the highest levels in support of the sustainability initiatives that are coming across the aerospace sector. But what we really get excited for too, Healy, is all of the other project pillars that we know are currently underfunded. We have an immense amount of work still to do on our infrastructure space, on how we bring our utilities, our existing airports, both international, regional, and critically remote airports, into this conversation of a better connectivity with this new type of avi aviation transportation. The one point I'd like to bring just awareness to, and, and Bert brings a good point on the, the business model for moving passengers on an electric aircraft today is not there. We do know there is a marketplace today, though, to move highly sensitive, time sensitive, medical material with this new aircraft technology. Looking at cancer isotopes, human blood, and medicine to remote communities with a drone or RPAS solution, this can be done today with conventional technology. There is a marketplace for that, and that will continue to help unlock some of the future initiatives that we're trying to push as well. That's super powerful. I wouldn't have thought of those applications. Um, curious to hear, this morning on one of the panels I was attending, I heard a new terminology for myself at least. It was George Harvey. I don't know if you're here in the audience, but George Harvey from TransLink said, the future of transport is multimodal. And so I, given that this is the future of transport panel, I had to pull that in. And I was hoping that you can explain, Elizabeth, to our crowd tonight, what is intermodality and how do you think this will change mobility in the future? Well, uh, intermodality is the movement of goods uh, via a standardized system of transportation. Um, so in this case, really, we're talking about the movement of goods in shipping containers. Um, so you see them here on the container ships. We see them on dredge trucks. We see them uh, moving on trains. And really, the advantage of this is that we can you know, put everything into the standardized unit, the container. It can start at the warehouse, and the goods all stay in the same space and can move from one side of the world to the other. Now, you, you may think, that sounds really simple. Why is that important? What's so great about that? Um, and I think we don't really appreciate on a day-to-day -day basis the advantages of standardization and the benefits that it brings um, to making systems linear, straightforward, easy to manage. And I'm going to kind of revert back to looking at the opposite scenario here. So if we think about the movement of goods, we think about taking all those goods out of that container and shipping them via different you know, transportation systems, different ways, different weights, um, all this sort of stuff. Now things become really variable and much more uh, difficult to manage, um, say, safety around that, the costs around that, the sustainability of those transportation systems, the emissions around that, all those sorts of things. So when we standardize, we really start streamlining our resources and making things easier to manage, and we also create um, you know, this connectedness between different parts of the world so that makes them work together, right? Thank you for providing that background. Um, another 
big thing right now that I'm reading about is, and I'm pulling this, this is ad lib, so I apologize, I'm putting you on the spot, but a huge word right now, of course, is all around circular economies. I'm curious to know from any of the panelists tonight um, what your thoughts are on circular economies and shared mobility. Like, do you really see a future in Vancouver where we are, you know, all of us sharing cars or, or other forms of transit? Well, I would, I, would, I would love that, but it, it's interesting because the a recent stat that I that that I saw is that pre-COVID and post-COVID. So if you look at the last the last three years, there hasn't actually been any reduction, or it's very very small within North America. I think it's under five percent in actual vehicle traffic. So what's actually shift when you think of vehicle traffic on the road? There's less individuals traffic, but there's more commercial traffic when it comes to. Amazon deliveries, Uber drivers, Lyft drivers. So you actually haven't seen, even though more people are working from home, more people are not on the road commuting, there's a lot more delivery services, it actually hasn't reduced the movement of people and goods. Everything is still moving around as much. So you could get into this inter, modality or car sharing and circular economy, but there has to be sort of fundamental changes in either human behaviors or full electrification of, of vehicles, and maybe it's not electrification, maybe it's hydrogen, because I don't know if there's enough ferrous magnets in the world to actually to do um, electric vehicles for everybody, but these are some of the more challenging problems that when you actually look at the stats around it, that when you start even car sharing, you start to give up cars, it doesn't actually reduce the movement of things and it doesn't actually have any sort of net impact on pollution. That's really interesting. Sorry. Important fact. <laughs> no, no, it's inter you know, this is what we yeah. need to hear. It's interesting, you know, we can have these ideas, um, but it has to be practical. Um, on to more of a, this is kind of a far-fetched future vision, but I'm curious to know from your experience in air mobility, JR, if you see a future where we will be in fact flying cars. I know that there's technology with drones, but do you envision that for passengers? So this was a, a big kind of announcement when it came out in about that 2017, 2018 time that urban air mobility was the concept of the Jetsons finally coming to reality and this air taxi aspect. We've been working really hard to break down that narrative and change that marketing side that, uh, of course, Wall Street and a lot of the companies that have been pushing in the recent timeframes. And our language that we're really trying to embrace is how do we embrace the evolving aviation ecosystem? that includes all of our flying vehicles, all of our aircraft, from our small drone operations that we see today, all the way up to our commercial aircraft, and of course, these new technologies coming online for supersonic, and of course, commercial space travel as well. This umbrella of the evolving aviation ecosystem will have different operating pillars serving different arms, but we have heard from all of the work across the country that our cities and regions do not want flying drones delivering Slurpees and pizzas to people's front doors anytime in the near future. So that is not a model that we're looking at. We do see a need where it makes economic, environmental, and social equitable sense to look at an aviation solution to complement existing public transportation, provide a better connective service for our regional and remote airports, and critically, replace some existing conventional aircraft routes, which we have many in the lower mainland. Think of your Vancouver, Victoria, Kelowna, Nanaimo opportunities as near-term use cases where this technology makes sense. It is not going to be a ubiquitous transportation solution. That's not what we're pushing for. We're finding those collaborative opportunities. Thank you for that background. I'm a little bit disappointed. No Justin's cars, but uh, that makes sense. It has to make sense for the entire system. Um, before we turn on to our Slido questions for this evening, I do have one final question. Um, it was mainly directed for Brian. Um, obviously, outside of government support, many innovators are looking for private sector for funding. Curious to know, you know, as you assess these investments, um, what are you funding and not funding in mobility? Are there mandates that are driving these investment decisions outside of ESG? And what are some of the metrics you use? Yeah, I'd say that the more challenging, you know, it comes back to fundamental metrics around a business, the more challenging businesses to the funds are the ones that are operating at low margins at scale. So, you know, you look at companies like 
Uber and Lyft that are operating at scale internationally, and you know they sometimes will break a profit, not often. So I think that sort of ride sharing, sharing economy, you know, does does have some issues when it, structural issues when it comes to comes to margins. So the areas that I'm more interested in is around shared infrastructure. Um, Things that I think will, will instead of being in, in a vehicle where you have a lot of sensors, actually then being able to try to connect the sensor, connect the vehicles into signaling, into the traffic signals, being able to provide them high precision geo positioning, which is a little bit at odds with some of the some of the large OEMs that are that are that are. You think of Tesla, where it's loading all of its vehicles with sensors to try to do automation, but you're starting to see the trends in the automotive sector. We're saying, okay, that might not be the route to get to autonomy. It might actually be through more shared infrastructure, such as in aviation or things like that, that then you know use signaling and air traffic control and things like that to be able to move vehicles around. And same with marine shipping and trying to put that more down into the traffic layer. Yeah, does that make sense? Yeah, that's super interesting. Is there any other criteria that you're using like outside of that like, when you're looking at these investments? Anything you're currently funding that you might be able to share which segment? Yeah, so you know it's pretty public. It's not a Vancouver-based company, but we did we're the lead investor in Milevision, which is a big traffic signals company. It's one of the big top four AI enabled looking at traffic flow. I think City of Vancouver is a customer. Um, certainly I've seen them, the Scout and the Scout Explorers around, at least from a mobile solution. I'm not sure about the permanent solution, but it's in hundreds of municipalities, operates I think in 90 different countries, you know, improving traffic flow um, and doing basically automating traffic engineering and traffic studies. The other thing that it does is traffic preemption where, and we haven't, I haven't seen this in Vancouver, but I'm sure it's coming soon, where transit or fire or police when they come up to a vehicle, they uh, come up to a red light or a green light, they're able to put all the lights to red so that they can safely flow through, through intersections. Um, and the company does a good, good line of business around that, is the leader in, in the US. I think it has about 90,000 intersections um, out of 100,000 of the intersections. So it's got uh, a real head start in that traffic preemption, which I think is pretty, in, pretty interesting when it comes to first responders and also for traffic and improving the flow there. Relatively simple solution. You know, I'm not sure why not all the major intersections don't have preemption why a cop or a transit vehicle isn't able to block the traffic be able to get through you'd think that that would be like 50s 60s style technology but in 2023 we still haven't figured it out and haven't put the initiatives in it but um, the US has put a pretty big funding initiative I want to say it's four or five hundred million dollars just to address I think half of it's gonna go to traffic preemption over the next four or five years so I think Canada will follow shortly behind that Super interesting. Yeah, I've heard there's a lot of investment in traffic control. Um, before we, very last question before we move on to Slido, I'm going to put this to Bert. I'm curious to know um, if there's anything for our audience that you would like to leave for them to learn about electrification of in the airspace or anything that we can do to support this. What you can do to support is to fly Harbor Air. <laughs> <laughs> um, <clears throat> joking aside, um, honestly, without the support, of our uh, customers, we wouldn't have been able to get this far. We've invested um, uh, about $5 million out of our own cash flow into this project to date, um, despite COVID, despite um, airlines obviously having had a very, very tough time during COVID. Um, we are um, the first carbon neutral airline in the world um, uh, where we offset uh, our carbon emissions um, thanks to the support of our customers, uh, but more importantly, um, it is thanks to a very, very loyal um, group of customers, both regular commuters, business, government traffic, as well as um, lots and lots of tourists that just love Harbor Air for what we're doing and um, are willing to give us that revenue, give us that confidence to allow us to continue to invest in, in, um, uh, in, our, in our project. And then secondly, um, you just mentioned it yourself, Healy. I, I'd love uh, for the community as a whole to say this is something that's tangible. This isn't, to your point earlier, uh, the fancy YouTube video where we start seeing EV tolls landing on our roofs and flying uh, um, around the world. This is something tangible. I said it earlier, we're losing a head start that we, as in Canada Inc., had before because we're just not fast enough adopting um, this new um, technology. So anything we can do in terms of getting that word out to say it's time that we 
speed that process up, both on the funding side as well as on the regulatory side, would be most appreciated. 100%. Thank you for sharing. Um, so now it's my favorite part of the evening. We turn over to Slido for questions from the audience. So if you could please help me by adding any questions you have. And you can also vote on other questions if you want to upvote them. Share via this link. They should come up on the screen. All right. Can I, can I ask a question? I've yeah, got a question. Of course. Because I've looked at this before from a VC perspective, and I'm curious to sort of say, what is, what is your estimate to sort of get a new fl f frame certified, like a new aircraft certified that's, that's electric? What's the total all-in cost of that? It can't, it can't be cheap. Yeah, we're looking at, so, so um, uh, what makes us unique is that we're using a pretty old aircraft and essentially electrify the um, the machine that we have. So if you do have a chance, if you haven't had a, an opportunity here while you're in Vancouver, uh, go to the waterfront here. You'll see a couple of our uh, iconic Canadian built the Haviland Beaver aircraft. Um, those are the ones that we're electrifying. Um, and we're looking at roughly $2 million per aircraft to get that aircraft fully electrified. Okay. Okay. Yeah, so lot Canadian, cheaper. sorry. It's a lot cheaper than getting a full, that's a lot cheaper than getting a full new airframe certified. Okay, got it. Thank you for sharing. We have some questions from the audience now. Top of the list right now, it says, it seems like government funding is the only way to accelerate decarbonization and transportation. How ideally should the private sector play a funding role? Who would like to answer this? Like to Maybe I'll say something because I'm only like four and a half months in my government job. And so if you ask me a government question, I'm going to give you a very honest answer. And I was thinking about this actually as, as I was listening to my colleagues up here speak. Um, you know, I think what Bird is doing at Harbor Air is really great because uh, you know, we talk about decarbonization, we talk about wanting to get to zero, we talk about all these things, but the reality is that the cost for the first movers is really prohibitive, and particularly in the maritime sector where, you know, things on the ocean, and this is the same for the harbor airplanes, they're exposed to air, sunlight, and salt water, and this is the recipe for corrosion. So if you want to, you know, run a cable on land, you could be looking at $100. If you want to put a cable on a ship, you could be looking at $1,000 for the same length. The cost is really that much more. Um, and so, you know, I think when I just came from, you know, VMCC, the not-for-profit, and then working internal to government, and I think it's really a mystery to a lot of organizations or companies, you know, how do I interact with government? How do I let them know my needs? How do I communicate with them? And to be very honest, I'm still trying to figure this out a little bit myself, but what I've noticed is, you know, government puts out these strategies. We just launched the BC Maritime Industry Strategy. I would highly suggest to anybody to go look at the strategy that's relevant for your industry sector or related to what you're working on, look through the commitments made in that strategy, and then reach out to that ministry and that department and just start talking to them, talk to them about what you're working on, how you can contribute to that, and really figure out, you know, um, what you can feed into that to get that support from government that you need, whether it's you know the regulatory side of things or the funding side of things, they want to hear this, the opportunity is there. And for me internally, I am having this conversation very much saying we need to clearly communicate with industry how to interact with this strategy and why aren't we having these conversations? It's a, I feel like you know we, the legislation to decarbonize is set by government the first movers are highly penalized by making that large capital investment. Government should be helping to support them, whether it's through uh, directed and strategic funding um, for those initiatives specifically, or through you know having a, a bridging fund, something like this, but there's lots of possibilities. Um, and then you can kind of hear me talking from both perspectives here. Um, yeah, that the private sector, you guys just go out, start talking to someone. Or even where um, I talk with a lot of shipyards, uh, this is a construction site. Shipyard owners are not that modern. A lot of them here in BC are in the suburbs and they're using computers not for internet based purposes, like really for internal inventory or very simplistic things, you know. And I think, um, you know, they're wondering how do I interact or, you know, what do I do? And um, it's really just about, for them, 
they can even hire someone to help with government relations. That cost of having someone on staff who has that specific um, knowledge and set of expertise, when you think about you might be paying someone 130 or more thousand a year to do that role, and now you have millions of dollars coming in just based on the work they've done for some set period of time, your return on that investment is really substantial. Some really great background. Thank you for sharing. Um, does anyone else want to add to that, or should we move to the next question? Next question? Our next one on the list um, is actually for each of you. What technologies or innovation are you really excited about in your respective area? You want to start off, JR? Um, well, I'll just say something uh, that's kind of, I never expected was going to be a part of the field of aviation when we, when we started up CAM. But um, out at Sea Island, at Vancouver International Airport, they have the company that's called General Fusion that is looking at trying to commercialize fusion as our sustainable energy source. And when you look at the graphs, of course they have lots of R&D still to do and we're still on a long journey there, but the language that they like to use is our energy problems will become insignificant when we can really tap into that new energy source. So all the work that we still have to do in sustainability today to decarbonize, uh, it's just exciting to know that there are some irons in the fire for some of those long shot opportunities as well. Super exciting. Elizabeth, what are you seeing in your world? I'm, like, I'm thinking about actually someone who got up and gave a pitch earlier, this Volt Safe application here. Um, and you know, this uh, plug that they've generated um, is a magnetic plug. And again, this is a technology like the three pronged plug in our houses that hasn't really seen a lot of changes recently. Um, and likewise, on vessels, if anybody's been a sailboat owner, you know what it's like to screw that you know, plug onto your boat and it gets corroded in salt water and all that sort of stuff. But the really neat thing about this plug is that it's also a smart plug. So it can measure and meter how much electricity you're putting on your vessel, which if you're into carbon credits and this sort of thing is part of the low carbon fuel standard, now you have a way to start measuring what's going on your ship. And I think when we have these really simple ideas that can create such opportunity, um, that's what I get really excited about. That's really cool. I'll just try. Thank you for sharing. It's a really broad, broad question, so I just sort of sat here thinking about it for a while. You know, from a, from a telco perspective, I'd say that we're seeing really, really large investments in 5G and mobile edge compute. And for people that aren't, aren't familiar with 5G, it's a new technology standard, and maybe you have 5G on your, on your phone, that is really around low latency. And maybe it'll make your phone go a little bit faster, you can see the videos go real faster. But really what it's used for and what was designed 5G for was around autonomy and to be able to have low latency interaction between different devices running through telcos. So if you have large, you know, the US, Canada, Europe, and, and Asia, um, all sort of in, in implementing 5G at the same time along with a really, really mass adoption of IoT technologies, and you got to talk about new sensors here in drones and sensors in, 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 in airplanes, you know, that is, I think the, the compounded annual growth rate right now of IoT connections, at least for us, is over 30, 35%. And historically, that's been about 12 or 13%. So we've seen a doubling in the growth rate of IoT connections. And then you combine that with 5G. You're, we're going to be in a world in five or 10 years where almost anything that moves is going to have an internet connection that's low latency. And then once you have that, you can sort of imagine how these things interact with each other and are going to drive autonomy. Yeah, I'm probably most excited about um, new, as far as new technologies is concerned, around um, hydrogen and um, hybrid. Um, so you've heard me talk about our e-plane a lot this evening. That for sure is the big focus for us, primarily because we're seeing and experiencing every day how difficult it is to get an e-plane certified here in Canada. Um, but when it comes to that second Part of that question, uh, what makes me so excited about innovation is the fact that um, we're very transparent around what we're doing. We're very keen on sharing our knowledge, our data, our experience. Um, do we have all the answers? No. And yes, I made it sound like it wasn't that difficult earlier. Um, but when it comes to innovation, I think what makes it very attractive to us, what makes it so unique to arguably everyone here in the room is that you know, if we truly want to innovate, we've got to share our experience um, and um, share the data 
um, and work towards a much more innovative approach to, uh, to the future of transportation. Thank you for sharing. Our next question has, well, we have two, two with really top votes. So we'll go to, what are your thoughts on the Hyperloop or SpaceX rockets as modes of long haul transport? Could they replace trains and planes in the near future? Do you wanna take this? Was this, no? <laughs> I was like looking at this thinking, hmm, that's really interesting. I don't read about this often. Um, but I, I mean, like maritime ships are, um, you know, the most energy efficient way to transport goods. Um, I don't know much about uh, rockets and how that would change, but my understanding is that aviation or even road transport is not as efficient as um, maritime transportation. So I don't foresee these technologies replacing, but I haven't done much reading on it. I could be wrong. And I'll just give some of the insight from the aviation side is what we're excited about are the concentric circles coming from all of the work. You look at what Elon has been doing on the Tesla side and on the other side of the spectrum on the SpaceX aspect. Now all that technology is only helping further our developments on the aviation side for both civil and of course as we look into the, the space side as well. So really these are, I don't really treat them as replacements, but complementary technologies to help expedite all those different modes of transportation. We will still need slow remote aircraft in Canada. We will still need the opportunity for, for rocket launches as well. And especially with the work that's going on in Eastern Canada, with Canada gaining its own agency to launch our own rockets, this uh, cycle of innovation is only going to be forwarded here in the Canadian side. And Jira, I'll, I'll top up because if you look at sort of what SpaceX has had on a mobility revolution is the, is the launching of microsat technologies, right? So you have now a lot of microsat technologies that are able to provide a lot of real-time information on what the world looks like, what's happening in wildfires, what's happening in maritime situations to a degree and a fidelity that was not available before SpaceX was launching the degree of microsatellites that we are seeing now. And then also you have Starlink on top of that, which is within SpaceX that is gonna be able to provide you know, near broadband, ubiquitous internet connection, perhaps globally. So, you know, I think that these are fundamental infrastructures, and I've previously been an investor in SpaceX, uh, TELUS isn't, but, you know, these are fundamental companies that are revolutionizing all sorts of different aspects of the world, including mobility. 100%. I think Starlight has massive implications for, especially for developing countries. It's really exciting. Um, our next question is, I'm curious as well, I'm curious to know if you've inquired to see if Harbour Air can benefit from this $350 million new Canadian fund. Have you looked into this? I guess we'll find out soon. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, I haven't seen the exact requirements yet. I don't think they've been uh, communicated since the announcement last week at the Paris Air Show. Um, but obviously we're, we're paying close attention to this. Um, whether it's this fund or any of the other funds um, that, um, as GR mentioned earlier, that traditionally haven't been targeted towards air transportation, um, but we are uh, working uh, collaboratively with the federal government at the moment on um, trying to ensure that um, we get federal funding. It is tied to the earlier question around private funding. It is um, uh, definitely a requirement uh, in many of the conversations we're having at the moment. Uh, quite frankly, a bit embarrassing to have to consistently explain that the federal government hasn't spent a single dollar on such an exciting initiative, whereas we're not having a hard time getting private funding uh, for um, something like this. So um, I think, like I said, we'll find out soon as to whether it's this $350 million fund that was announced at the Paris Air Show or hopefully other federal funding that's becoming available at short notice. Oh, I got upvoted. Um, the next question is also anonymous. It says, do you believe that Canada has the appropriate industrial policy to ensure success of the industrial base for their next generation of transportation? It's a very policy heavy question. I don't know if anyone who has to step up to answer that one. I'll start on some of the work, uh, and this is where we have the privilege of a lot of our contacts and organizations based in the aerospace sector 
in southern uh, Ontario as well as uh, the Montreal region, which is the golden star for aviation in Canada. Uh, we really see a base that we can build upon, and what gets us excited is now that base is motivated to start that transition towards our sustainable aviation future. So this has been a critical mass change, especially in this last year, that we get really excited about on the aviation side, and we're seeing that only expedited from the work coming out of the automotive sector, and then as uh, we were hearing from uh, Brian too, but on the space sector as well. So thumbs up from our side. Thank you for sharing that. That was a tricky question. Um, I think one question, if it's okay if I bring one of my own questions in before we do one last slide, is I'm super curious, Elizabeth, I saw, you know, during COVID, the shipping costs went up. If anyone has ordered online during COVID, you've seen that costs skyrocketed. And I've heard from my friends who work in furniture companies that shipping containers went from, well, I won't quote numbers, but about, they doubled in cost to go from Asia to Canada in, in the previous years. Curious to know your background on, on what was affecting that and why it's changing and coming back to regular pricing now. Yeah. You know, I've worked in that industry for 10 years and I never heard anybody talk about logistics or shipping until COVID. And it was really interesting to me because actually I gave birth to my second son two days before we went into lockdown. And as you guys know about like the toilet paper wars and all these sorts of things. And, you know, my mom friend suddenly our chat stream was all like logistics, this and that. And I was like, this is a really strong, strange conversation to be having with uh, my, you know, my mom friends, but basically, you know, what was happening there was um, due to COVID, ships were stuck at anchor outside ports, um, and they were not able to go into the ports to offload their containers, to onload containers. Um, ship staff were stuck on board the vessels. People may not be aware that, you know, ratings on board ships, which are, you know, the ch chief, the captain, chief officer, chief engineer, all, all these ratings, they contracts are usually like three or four months. Now they were stuck on board for almost a year. It was quite a long time. Non-ratings on board the vessel. Um, there's typically a complement about 30 staff on board the ships. They can do seven, eight months. Some of these guys were just stranded at sea due to these delays happening like outside Singapore or Asia. Um, California saw vessels just pile up. Um, COVID testing, you know, someone on board maybe had COVID or someone in port had COVID. It was just shutting things down. Um, and this is really driving freight rates in the long direction and affecting trade. And I think it, you know, we still see, you know, vacancies of products and different things like that on shelves. Um, hopefully that starts to level out. Um, but yeah, that was what was driving that situation there. That's super interesting. I didn't know it was due to congestion or policy around COVID. Yeah, I thought maybe it was gas prices, so thank you for sharing. Um, the next question, perhaps our last tonight, is from Keith in our audience. He is wondering, he said, the pandemic seemed to slow, show a fragility in our global transportation network. Should we, we, should we be working on hardening these systems along with innovating? More controls, more systems. What are your thoughts on this? Brian, you look. I'll take it because, you know, a lot of our portfolio company, a lot of my portfolio companies specifically are IoT companies. So they were heavily impacted by transportation networks uh, failing to get suppliers to be able to ship components. Um, you know, and what we did within our portfolio is start developing APIs to hammer supply chain systems, you know, and using automation to actually book freight, book whatever piece of, of of chip that we could find and then using the engineers as opposed to developing specifically for the app for the hardware and for the applications actually specifically targeting them you know with automation and ai to actually be able to fulfill fill our supply chain so it wasn't a great solution but i'd say that you know that was a mandate that we did across most of our portfolio companies that had this as we said start you know start your developers actually pointing them to the to the systems to try to automate it and we heard some lightning pitches around that today so maybe i should have commercialized that idea too because it's not a bad, not a bad one. Um, but yeah, I think it's tough. You know, these are moving systems that are designed to be low cost, very, very efficient. And when there's turbulence in them, which there was, you know, they're going, they're going to break. Um, but to now, to date, they've actually all recovered. So, you know, we're not seeing that same fragility that we are in terms of supply chain for our portfolio companies. We have 60 of them and about half of them are hardware based. So I think that's a good supply. That's a good, good metric. Super interesting. Well, I think it's also inspiring when we think about, you know, uh, during COVID, obviously there was a pandemic everybody agreed on was a global emergency, but our board was talking about this the other day, how, you know, 
obviously it was a horrible situation, but we had all these nations collaborate and develop policy, you know, because it was an emergency state. And hopefully that will give us some inspiration to our ability to collaborate nationally and internationally on big issues um, when it comes to this and for even for mobility. So there's hope that we can innovate. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. Um, I'm going to welcome Kukai back to our stage to do closing remarks, but I'm really grateful that all of you made time in your busy schedules to join us. And I also want to personally thank um, the collaborators from TransLink and Invest Vancouver who made this possible in addition with Commotion. It's been a wonderful day. A round of applause for our panelists.